right. So <laughs> we have a couple minutes to talk about saving the world. So no big deal, right? Um, the f I wanted to kick this thing off by asking everyone sort of one question that the, the one burning question that I have as a journalist talking about climate and tech. And let's start with you, John. Uh, you are at a B corporation, right? And, and these are entities that are designed in a sense to meet these huge social environmental challenges. Yeah. So what is the role of B corporations of in general corporate structure in tech in meeting the challenge of climate change and in thinking about how we orient our business structures for the future? Thanks, Van. Um, hello, everyone. Um, the first thing to say, B corporations are not going to save us if it comes to addressing the climate challenge. There are a growing number of them around the world, uh, several thousand. Patagonia uh, in the audience, uh, people like Natura, some quite big ones. But most of them are really quite uh, small. They all uh, believe in climate change. Uh, most of them are thinking about what their role might be. But I think we've got to uh, switch on the much bigger uh, companies if we're going to really shift the needle here, including the big uh, oil companies. And one of the things I'm increasingly thinking about is how do we bribe the oil companies to do the right thing? I mean, if you go back into the deep history of, for example, slavery uh, in the United Kingdom, we spent uh, in the 1830s 23 million pounds in one year to bribe the slave owners to give up their property rights to slaves. That was billions of pounds in today's uh, money. That's not unique. If you look at the farming community in Europe, the set-aside uh, policy is very much about bribing, to use a, a, a rather powerful word, farmers to sort of protect uh, wildlife. And we're doing the same now in cities to sort of help uh, promote electric vehicles and so on. So I'd, l by all means, let's talk about the big corporations, but at the same time, let's remember that the really big battalions are, are the multinational uh, corporations, and we really cannot exclude them from the debate. Okay, so Kathleen, you know, what, what John's talking about here are policies, are yeah. moving the arms and levers of governance towards making companies accountable and thinking about incentives and disincentives. So what policy levers are you dealing with now that people have at their means today to fight climate change? Well, um, it's a good question that they have very broad answer, but um, I'll try, try to limit me to, to some, um, some very important parts of that. Um, first of all, I, I do believe technology has a role to play, um, but you can, you can use the technology, as we all know, for the good or for the bad. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and it doesn't stand at itself to do the right thing. Uh, and in that sense, you always need policies. You always need a legal framework. Um, um, and especially in Europe, um, if you look to the industry today, um, uh, which has needs to, to go into a big transformation, um, uh, we can do that. Um, we have the skilled people to do that, and we have uh, normally the sense of urgency at the European level to put the right legal framework in place. Um, having said that, the last couple of years I've seen some reluctance to go really ahead on that. And sometimes I even see in the, in the corporate world more advancement, mm -hmm. and, and, and we uh, at the policy level are a little bit lagging behind. Uh. Um, I, I used to be um, uh, um, the chief of the inquiry committee in the, in the European Parliament on, um, on the Dieselgate Committee. I just use it as, a, as an example because it is, it is it's, a, it's a good way of looking at it. We had um, the former commissioner Potocznik, I don't know whether still rings a bell with some of the people. He was a former environment commissioner in the, in the in, in European Commission. And he said in our, in our inquiry committee, he said, Europe should take care not killing the industry with softness. Um, and what does, did he, and I absolutely completely agree with him, um, is that um, sometimes we are too soft for the industry in putting um, the legal framework straight and the ambitious straight. Um, um, tomorrow, I think the Commission will come up with uh, new standards on CO2. 
um, and, um, and the possibility of introducing a zero emission um, mandate into the car industry. And it will not be sufficient enough, and it will be the example of killing the industry with softness. The car industry, which is part, should be part of the solution eh, when we look to climate policy, the car industry in Europe is facing a, facing a huge crisis. And either we can make sure that we put a very high level of zero emission cars in place, a very high level of CO2, a very high level of NOx, with, and it's feasible, the technology is there, we just have to push it in that direction. And the last point I want to make, because it's a, it's a forgotten point, but it's a crucial one. Huh? Um, you have technology, you have the legal framework, but you also have society and people and human beings and the way we live together. If we want to solve the problems that we are facing with regard to climate change, we have to look to our societies and the way we live and, and organize our democratic system. Let me give the example of the cars again. We need zero emission cars and it will be the future. We should abandon all fossil fuels also in our transport system. But we also need to change our transport system. The fact that we all own our individual car is not the, is not the model that we need to do. So it's not just technology and the legal framework, but it's also working on the way we, 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 we live together on our societies. And climate change will never be solved unless you do it in a just transition. You make sure that you put the social issues and the environmental issues and the economic issues together. We know that under the umbrella of sustainability, and it's very obvious, but we still do not implement it in that way today. So I'm going to follow up on that because I live in D.C. and uh, I'm going to be taking everything we talk about here back to the president. <laughs> um, Good luck. <laughs> so when you're talking about creating these legal frameworks, uh, how exactly are people doing that in a, at a practical level, thinking about new, about novel technologies, about things that close the carbon cycle, about these, uh, about maybe locating car factories that, that, that create zero emission cars? Uh, I know maybe I'm thinking about it from a very American framework, but yes. usually Americans just give people tax money, <laughs> tax breaks to come build their company. Yeah. How, what's the model? Oh, but you have a very good model in the States. In California, you have the zero emissions mandate in right. California. And it works. You just have to oblige the companies to say, if you want to put a car on the market, let's, let me give you an example. If you, want, if you say to Volkswagen, huh, who has been cheating on us huh, for all this time, huh, so it's time to pay back. Huh? If you would say, if you want to put cars on the market, the European market, you can do so. And this is the level of NOx, and this is the level of CO2 that you have to meet up. And then, for instance, now 20% of your new car should be zero emission, zero emission. And if you cannot put a, a flea that compiles, compiles all these together, you're not allowed to put any cars on the market. You can do that. In California, you do that, and it works. Okay, so... Hisham, we are, this is a panel about technology with nobody, to my knowledge, from Silicon Valley on the panel, which is great. <laughs> um, with you having a company based in New York, yep. and you're thinking about this from a, a New Yorker perspective maybe, how do we orient the conversation of the relationship between technology, between technology people and the environment in a way that sort of gets away from focusing solely on Silicon Valley and maybe like Tesla. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I run a data technology company. It's based in New York. And, and I think one of the things that, that kind of culturally different about what we do is we're in the, you know, all of our clients, all of our stakeholders are in the backyard, right? Be it folks in DC, regulators who, who you know, come into the city being corporate giants who are based out of there. And I think w one of the bigger divides when it comes to, you know, climate change is that we, w you know, as she was mentioning, we have the tools, we have the legal frameworks, right? We have the technology to make it happen. Um, but, but I do second this, this thought that, you know, very few people are together in the same room, right? That's kind of why I'm here. That's kind of why a place like the forum is very exciting is you get to see these different points of view interact. And I'll give you a, an example, right? So we do a lot of work in the um, pharmaceutical adverse events management. You take a drug, you know, you get sick, uh, you're gonna call your doctor, doctor's gonna call 
the you know uh, the the drug company. Drug company is going to investigate, and it'll take them you know a couple hundred days to figure out what was wrong. Usually, on average. Um, but, but the reality is that the impact on climate change, how to fix it, it's very incremental. And what you need to be doing is working through a supply chain of you know, medical professionals all the way back to you know, the factories where these drugs were pr produced overseas and be able to reroute a boat in real time. Right? That, that technology exists, but we're very far from that future. And the coordinative power that we have is, is very weak, still political. Um, and I think it's, it, it's more about creating you know, incentive structures and interfaces for people to speak together more programmatically, uh, exchange data more openly, you know, uh, understand that we're all part of one big supply chain. Uh, I think that's really how tech kind of can have an answer for climate change, is, is, is really being this like protocol through which people are actually informed as to what's the optimal way to, to you know, use and not waste uh, energy. And you see that in the car example as well, right? Right. And we often think about tech and the private sector as a bit of a monolith when we talk about things like this. But how do you use platform, data platforms like yours to get people on that same page in the absence of regulation? Absolutely. Um, so you need to come in as, as an en enabler, right? Tech has this mantra, we're going to disrupt stuff, you know, we're going to completely change the model. The models don't change, right? Everything old is new again. You know, uh, 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 you know, versions of social media existed as you know gossip columns in the 1800s in, in newspapers, right? People will talk about you know who's the funny person in the town that. So I believe that tech is really here to uh, to kind of leverage uh, basically the the way in which human beings operate to reduce error, to improve accuracy of decision making in general. And I think that's an attitude that tech has kind of forgotten given the massive amount of, of wealth it's created. It's, you know, we, we, we've, we have an ego as tech companies. And we need to kind of reinsert ourselves into the daily operations of folks and remember, you know, hey, there, there's a way in which the world works. Let's kind of go in there, understand it first and look to really optimize, right? You have forever this notion of tech, hey, we're gonna go for cold fusion. We're gonna replace oil. Well, maybe you don't replace oil. Maybe you replace cars, right? And you, you think about you know, how people self-organize before you think about technology. I think that's definitely a New York you know, take on, on Silicon Valley. We feel a bit more connected to the rest of the world. Queens is the most culturally dense uh, piece of the planet. So uh, I certainly take pride in that. So this actually, I know Jyoti's been studying this and has been working on this very same thing on aligning the, what you're talking about, the demand and the supply sides of the problem. Talking about organizing people and organizing business in a way that works together. So can you explain sort of some of the good examples in tech of where that's happening and how to make the supply and demand side sort of a cohesive unit? So when we talk about uh, uh, technologies, there are several sets of technologies. One set, first set is energy supply side where um, you talk about removing fossil fuels or at least reducing the use of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, earlier we used to make electricity from coal, oil, gas, uh, and also nuclear, which is uh, low carbon or no carbon. And so, uh, but now we have renewable uh, whole portfolio of new technologies ranging from uh, solar, wind, um, biomass, and hy hydro has been around for a very long time. Uh, so in this case, user does not know uh, what, except some of the renewable technologies, what is driving, what, how, how its grid is, uh, what is supplied by the grid. Uh, so in some sense, user is indifferent. But um, in the uh, demand side, user has to adjust. And that could be ranging, again, we normally take sector by sector, power sector, transport sector, uh, building and, and agriculture. Uh, power sector, uh, we have LED bulbs like uh, and that sort of. So energy efficiency plays a very big role in the demand side. We have also uh, electric vehicles. 
where also people have to change their ways of what they, how they used to drive, and then it's a different ball game. Uh, some uh, technologies are very easy to shift to, but some may require some adjustments. Um, especially in buildings, you sometimes we have good uh, uh, air conditioning systems or, or heating systems, and that uh, sometimes increases comfort also. Uh, so this, uh, these are the two sets. But there's a third set, which is also uh, removing carbon from, uh, so these are all geoengineering and that, but they have not yet made that much progress on a large scale, though some people have succeeded to go somewhere. But uh, more than that, uh, we should also think of the entire uh, mobile internet computer interface, which uh, also reduces need for transport. Uh, people, whatever they used to do, people used to go very far away places to buy railway tickets or whatever they used to go uh, government offices now all that is uh, gone so it's it's it gives people a lot of time so together they provide an ecosystem which uh, uh, is uh, uh, very beneficial for should be beneficial for users but um, and and some things would not have worked if both uh, have not progressed for example Solar energy in India was not making very much headway till uh, photovoltaics price dropped and LED bulbs came along. Mm -hmm. Because then uh, you needed less uh, panel area because LED bulbs were very efficient. And uh, despite being backwards, sometimes I find there are more LED bulbs than sometimes in the developed countries in India because now we have almost made it a mandatory thing. Um, but at the, at this is the time to also talk about uh, equity. Uh, we have still 30% people in the world who don't have uh, energy access, uh, electricity for cooking, for lighting, for uh, so, uh, and children are dying, maternal deaths are there. So th there's a lot of development backlog which has to be caught up. And then they have to be brought, they will then demand these new technologies so we have to see how they would leapfrog so that they, when they start demanding energy, we would not have as much uh, big uh, need. And in fact, we could give it for even less energy than we are doing now. So uh, that, all that we have to think of the, uh, the entire scenario along with the society, along with the development plans. So in a way, uh, one should see, uh, think of technologies which should be of course, feasible, but economically viable and affordable and socially acceptable, as, as we just heard, and also uh, environmentally sound. So it looks like uh, technologies are, uh, uh, will do a lot to go further, but at the same time, there are uh, problems in, in people coping with it quickly, uh, getting, uh, accepting it and working with it quickly. So there is a, a social uh, barriers are also there. Uh, and, but having said all these uh, uh, barriers and other problems, uh, technology is the only hope. So you talked about uh, places that are not yet, they don't have mature grids yet, right? What about places that are in the process of industrializing or have recently industrialized, say maybe just got a coal plant, and they just invested lots of money and time into these new grids. How do you convince places like those to, say, embrace clean and green tech now when they just got these new grids? Um, yeah, the, uh, uh, that is a problem, of, of course, for also co investors. And many uh, people invested a lot in coal because uh, renewable energy uh, was not quite ready and suddenly within two, three years, prices started dropping. Uh, but still, uh, th they are, uh, th there are problems with it in the sense that they are not around for 24 hours. There are a lot of fluctuations. And um, so we are also wor work looking at how much uh, renewable energy can be integrated in current grid and, and in future grid. So can we uh, go into 100% renewable? Then what should be the storage prices? So uh, these are the issues that um, one has to think uh, when you talk about uh, low carbon. Uh, because finally, 
Earth's, uh, 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 I mean, atmosphere requires uh, almost uh, zero input of carbon for uh, uh, if you want to maintain two degrees temperature. Uh, so at some point we have to level it off uh, quite a lot. And uh, many people, uh, uh, developing countries are in the rising stage. So they, uh, they have not yet uh, used their carbon space, but when they are ready to use it, it's gone, more yeah. or less. So um, I wanted to ask this to both John and Kathleen. Uh, this hasn't been the best of weeks or months for the industry uh, in, in terms of public perception of it. You, I think you have a rising uh, public scrutiny of tech in a way that hasn't been seen before. Yeah. How do you deal with that rising scrutiny, skepticism, when there are leaders in the field who say they have the answer to these big societal problems. How do you bridge the gap there? Should, should it? A couple of things. Firstly, to your question to Giotti, I think one of the things we're going to see, and it's a brutal truth, is climate change, as it accelerates, is going to shut down the coal-fired power station. So stranded assets is not just an issue in the global north. We're going to see it right around uh, the world. To the question around... Um, where we're headed and where the tech industry is headed. It's interesting, about two or three years ago, I started going to see people like Singularity University, X Prize Foundation, Google X. Your, your colleague on the Atlantic just did a brilliant piece on, on, on Google X, Derek Thompson, very highly uh, recommended. And, and, and one of the things I asked these people, has, had they heard of Tom Midgley, Thomas Midgley Jr.? And routinely, the answer was no. And the reason why I asked the question, in the 20s and 30s, Tom Midgley worked firstly for General Motors and then DuPont. He had a hundred patents to his name, absolutely brilliant man. And I tell three very brief stories about Tom Midgley. The first uh, uh, innovation that he's remembered for is uh, leaded gasoline, which really damaged young people's uh, uh, nervous systems and, and uh, learning ability. The second one was freons, so cl cl chlorofluorocarbons, blew a hole in the stratospheric ozone layers. Somebody once said that he is the single organism that caused more damage to the atmosphere than any other organism in the planet's history. And then, very sadly, he contracted polio um, and developed himself a semi-robotic bed, which ended up strangling him. And I just make the point, because however brilliant you are, if you're in artificial intelligence or autonomous vehicles or internet of everything, you're going to cause completely unintended consequences which are completely invisible at the moment. And one of the things that we've been doing recently is working with the United Nations Global Compact with 10,000 uh, company members to bridge between that world of mainstream companies and some of the emergent tech players and trying to put those people together. And when we first started to do it last year, a couple of corporate people came up to me afterwards. We had somebody from Singularity University on the stage and said, why have you got someone from a weird organization like that on the stage? My answer, you'd have said exactly the same thing about Greenpeace 30 years ago. You'd have said the same thing about Muhammad Yunus and social innovators and social entrepreneurs 15 years ago. Get used to it. You're going to have to get uh, involved in this very different agenda. So. Well, well, first on, on, on uh, the coal fire plants, uh, your question on that, and, and, and uh, um, it's a pressing issue. It, it will vanish eventually, but it is a pressing issue today and um, makes me a little bit uh, sad um, in the aftermath of Paris. And, and we were now uh, in Bonn. We will, uh, I will be in Bonn next week on, on, uh, on the COP23. Is that... Um, We've, we did not, m although there was a, a lot of euphoria and you said we were moving in the right direction and finally we had that agreement, um, um, everybody knows it's not sufficient enough and it lacks um, hard implementation and, and the coal-fired plants is, is, is a very good example. We should have agreed globally that it is illegal to, to invest in new coal-fired plants, point and then take the time to transition into the and, 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 and phase out the other fossil fuels. In, 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 in but that should be like an initial agreement. Um, and then you have like the hypo hypocrisy today that although China, being one of the front runners now uh, of the implementation of Paris, says, oh, we will, I, I forgot the number, but like we will not build 
another 140 new coal fire plants. We will not build another new... They okay, that's good, that's good. But at the same time, they are investing in coal fire plants in India and in, in Africa. So it, for me, that's a huge hypocrisy, and, and it's also part of, of European policy, so it's, it's, not, it's not pointing the finger to the, to the others. Having said that, I'm absolutely um, advocating at the European level, together with a lot of colleagues, um, especially my political group, we try to advance in that sense to at least get a phase out in, phase out in coal fire plants in Europe to set the standard. Um, and that means with a huge effect in Germany, but also, of course, in the eastern part of Europe that will, will create a lot of um, um, challenges. But we can do that. We can we can show the world that we can do that. And again, I come to my first point that I said, you, knew, you need to do that in a just transitional way, of course. Um, it's one of the mistakes that Hillary Clinton made um, uh, by pointing out, yes, we, we need to transform, and that's good, transition. But at the same time, you need to show people that also for them, working in the coal-fired plants and all the, the, the industries that are related to that, that they still have a future, that they can be... Uh, they can have uh, educational training, that, that you also protect them. Um, climate action should also be about just transition and protecting people, because otherwise we will fail. Yeah. So the point you're making about, I mean, mm. going back to the coal-fired plants, right, and about how there's going to be so much of a disincentive for them to exist, they will fade out of existence mm. soon enough, but there also will be an increasing financial incentive for tech companies to get involved in the green game. Of course. How do you balance that financial incentive with justice? How do you basically get people to align those incentives, get companies to align those incentives? It, it's, a, it's about, um, uh, it's about um, uh, equal access for everybody, for instance, to energy. Um, we are discussing today the clean energy package in, uh, in Europe. And we are pressing very hard at the same time for the climate goals as for um, uh, addressing energy poverty. And that should be the issue in, in the, 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 the challenge in India is much more bigger, of course. That's what you said about leapfrogging. Eh? You have to take everybody into an energy transition. In India, you can leapfrog immediately into renewable energy, um, but make it accessible for everybody. And I know it's easier said than done, eh? um, but um, uh, it's possible and of course, even today, in Europe, we are subsidizing hugely fossil fuels. Um, uh, so as long as we put our money in the wrong direction, it's completely the other way around. It's so logical that renewable energy, it doesn't cost anything. Of course, it costs the investment of the, of the infrastructure, but it doesn't cost... It's for free, people. It's for free. And in that sense, it should be accessible for everybody. So it, it's dual. So, Ishan, when we're talking about... Uh aligning societal, just knowledge of the problem, f first and foremost. What's the role of data? We, we're, we're, yeah. looking, we're sitting in a landscape now post some pretty big public climate reports. Yeah. Uh, what's the role of data in informing people, but informing them in a way that's responsible and doesn't cause, say, panic or the reverse, which is dis disinterest? Yeah, so mm. uh, it's, uh, it's a tricky question because, uh, you know, one of the reasons we found that this company is actually you know, one was the financial crisis and just scared as to how people couldn't connect the dots. There was unemployment in places that they were, you know, leveraging homes. And another was climate scientists are actually really bad at sharing data with each other, right? Like even the people who are at the forefront of research are having a hard time, you know, basically merging their data together for a singular view, let alone the layers to the consumer. But you know, some tech companies are, are actually doing a really good job at it. So take, say, Apple. Apple will tell you to the percentage grade you know, the, the energy usage of an iPhone. So it turns out like more than two-thirds of the energy usage of an iPhone in its lifetime is actually when it's manufactured in the plant. So every single time you charge your phone for four years and however much electricity that takes and so on and so forth, you know, most of the energy waste is you know, yeah. at time of production. So if you're going to spend any money investing in, you know, climate and energy efficiency, you want to allocate that money. Because we all know it's not just about saying you should do this. Uh, more so, it's the operational concern of how, yeah. right? We, we human beings are great at saying we should do this. Uh, I think what we're really bad at 
And what data can help us is the how. And it's the making sure that every time you, know, you, you set an idea and people come together, that there's some success and outcomes and measurements so that accountability becomes less political and we can rally around, around something common and, and tangible. So you can put more of the onus less on politicians and politics and things people don't like and place it more in their own lives and, and their own hands. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that's all the time we have. Great. Yeah. This was great. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Did we just walk off? <laughs> <laughs> well done.